Our next speaker is Dr. Jeremy Marty Dugas, who completed his PhD at the University of Waterloo under the supervision of Dr. Dan Smilek. And he is currently the McCall McBain Postdoctoral Fellow in Education and Cognition right here at McMaster University. They say that fortune favors the prepared mind, but let's face it, some of us are more lucky than others. Uh, for example, in 2017, Jeremy won five free teas in a row during the Roll Up the Rim uh, event. What's more, he didn't even buy the first tea. A friend bought it for him. These putative events are being investigated by the Guinness Book of World Records, or at least they should be. Please join me in welcoming Jeremy. Thank you for that introduction. <laughs> Uh, I, I didn't buy him a tea back, but he did still ask me to be one of his groomsmen for an eventual wedding later, uh, some years from now, we'll see. Okay. Where's your smartphone right now? For many of you, I would imagine that it's within arm's reach. It's probably almost always within arm's reach. This is something that is unique to smartphones, unlike other digital technologies like TVs or laptops that we leave behind, the smartphone comes with us. And it's because of their constant presence that smartphones have a lot of opportunity to influence our psychology, our, our thoughts, our feelings, and our behaviors. And it's because of this potential influence that many people have become concerned in, in different ways about smartphone use and what sort of effects it might have on us. Now, sometimes those concerns are about uh, using it at the dinner table or it's flip-flopping role in education. Others might be concerned that it is causing our brains to rapidly deteriorate. Some, some have even gone so far as to claim that the human attention span is now shorter than that of a goldfish thanks to smartphones. Now, some of these concerns are more legitimate than others. The goldfish one is particularly dubious, but with all the information out there and the various sort of sources that you can find, it can be difficult to know just how concerned we should be and what we should be concerned about. Uh, so I'd like to start just by reviewing some of the documented issues that exist for smartphone use in relation to our psychology. So people who use their smartphones more often tend to report more symptoms of depression and anxiety. They're also more stressed and tend to make more attention errors and lapses. They also mind wander more frequently, which is another form of this sort of inattentive cognition. And so if we take these on face value, uh, it seems like smartphones are a pretty bad thing because generally we want to be uh, more attentive and less depressed rather than the other way around. But there's an important factor that often goes unaccounted for in a lot of the research that looks at smartphone use. Usually they just sort of ask about the frequency with which people use their phones in a sort of just very straightforward and, and maybe even unsophisticated way. And so one important factor that does get left behind is what I like to call absent-minded smartphone use. And this is something I'm sure you've experienced. Perhaps uh, you come home from a long day or you, know, you come from one room in your house to another room in your house as it is now. And uh, you sit on the couch and you, you get your phone out and you begin to scroll. And so this is the thing that, that characterizes absent-minded smartphone use. It's endless scrolling, habitual checking, maybe losing track of time. And more generally, I would say absent-minded smartphone use, it occurs when we're using our phone without awareness or for no particular reason. And as it turns out, this is actually quite an important factor to look at when we're considering how smartphone use relates to all these different negative outcomes that people are interested in. So rather than being driven by smartphone use per se, as it turns out, it's actually absent-minded smartphone use that can account for most of the relations between smartphone use in general 
and all of these negative outcomes, right? So rather than general smartphone use, it's actually this sort of specific particular way of using your smartphone that drives a lot of these relationships. What this means is that maybe by using our phones with purpose and intention, we might be able to avoid many of the negative outcomes that are associated with mindless use. Now, unfortunately, this might be easier said than done, and that's because of the way that we form habits. So I'd like you to think back to when you first learned to tie your shoes. You had to really concentrate. You had to uh, focus and think about all the different steps and remember them and get them in the right order. And maybe you can even remember uh, feeling proud when you first learned to be able to do this. But now, uh, as you went on and did it more and more often, well, you do it without a second thought. It's not something you really need very much awareness to be able to do. And this is the case with any behavior. It becomes more automatic and more habitual over time. You can do things that at first you had to be very intentional about, you can now do them without awareness. And it's the same with your smartphone. The more you use your smartphone, the more automatic this behavior becomes. And that puts you at risk for falling into the trap of using it in an absent-minded way. And that's, that's certainly a trap uh, that I fall into. But this isn't, this isn't entirely your fault because unlike your shoelaces, the smartphone is actually intentionally designed in a way to co-opt your attention system, to hijack your attention system and direct it for you. Um, so this is a, a picture of Tristan Harris, who you may be familiar with. He is a former product manager at Google. And what he does now is he spends his time trying to uh, warn and inform people about the goals that many of these different companies building uh, phones and different applications that you might use on them, the goals that they have. And that is to, as they put it, to hack your brain. Brain hacking is the term that they like to use. And what they wanna do, according to him, is to, to use their knowledge of human psychology and neuroscience and leverage that to make you spend as much time as possible using these devices sort of regardless of whether it's actually serving you. And, and you can see, as he explains here, it's actually something that's very simple to do and put into all sorts of different products. Uh, so you might wonder, um, with the odds stacked against us like this as they are, can we really hope to avoid absent-minded use? And I think, I think the answer is yes. And just knowing and being aware of this sort of intentional design is one way, uh, one thing to keep in mind that I think can help us use our smartphones with more awareness um, and actually practice and make, make sure that rather than serving our smartphones, uh, we're making sure that they're serving us, right? It's supposed to be a device uh, that's often sold to us as making our lives easier and um, by using them with awareness, I think that can help make sure that it's actually delivering on that promise. So I'd like to end just with some uh, straightforward tips that I think people can use to avoid absent-minded or mindless use. And the first is making your phone slightly harder to access. So uh, for example, um, you can leave your phone in the front hall or coat pocket hung up in the closet. And this is one way that now, unlike your usual behavior of just being able to pick it up automatically or habitually, you actually have to be very intentional, uh, intentional about going to get it if it's in a different physical location, right? It's also a good idea in the car. Just put it in the back seat where you can't reach or, or see it. Um, another thing that you can do is to change your passcode. Now, you'd have to do this relatively frequently, but your passcode is something you enter uh, dozens or maybe even hundreds of times a day. It's a highly, highly automated behavior. And once you've entered your phone, you can start using it uh, for all kinds of different things out of habit rather than out of intention. But if you change your passcode, 
and you get that error message that you've gotten it wrong. Now, probably first, you'll try to enter it again really quickly right away. But what it can do is serve as uh, a stop signal and interrupts that automatic behavior. And that can give you a few moments and opportunity to think to yourself, well, do I really need to use my phone right now? Do I really even want to? And I think those are questions worth asking ourselves to make sure that uh, our smartphones for, are doing for us rather than the other way around. Um, so I'll, I'll thank you for your time and attention. I'm, I'll end there. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Um, every single time you ask, you know, where is your smartphone? It's uh, either right next to me or right in front of me as it is right now. Um, so that's always a, a good reminder uh, to sort of, you know, detach ourselves from our smartphones just a bit. Um, so there's uh, one question from the chat that is asking, um, do you think smartphones have been a net benefit or cost to society? These sorts of things are always difficult to um, fully assess. The, the thing that people will often say, I'm going to do an academic thing here, I'm going to dodge the question actually and make up one of my own to answer. But uh, the thing people often say, right? So you'll, you'll usually see somebody saying, well, it's a tool. A hammer is not bad or good. You could use it to build a, a birdhouse or to hurt someone with. It's a tool. It's, it's not good or bad. And the thing is, is that unlike many other tools, the smartphone is designed, it's specifically designed to make you use it in this absent-minded way. And it's, it's this sort of absent-minded way, as well as other things that, that are associated with these negative outcomes. And so uh, it's hard to say whether it would be, you know, a net positive or a net negative. It's, it's probably more useful now than it has been when a pandemic isn't going on for staying connected to people. Um, but as smartphone ownership has gone way up, so too has the experience of loneliness. So uh, I, I'd be very skeptical of people saying it's a net positive. Absolutely. I'm sure we could have a uh, long discussion back and forth about the pros and cons. Um, and speaking of people feeling satisfied or not about their smartphones, um, I forgot about the poll question. So uh, the majority of people who responded either rarely or sometimes uh, leave their phone feeling deeply satisfied, which is quite interesting. Um, and then finally, we have one question actually straight from the audience. Um, and people were asking, are children perhaps at greater risk of falling into this mindless use? And what can parents do to help mitigate their children's um, over usage? Yeah, it's a, it's a very, very good question. And I would say that much of the research out there on uh, different devices uh, and things that people have used has been done on, on adults or young adults who had the experience of knowing what it was like uh, without um, multitasking with different media or without using their smartphone. And people are able to tell somewhat whether it's hurting them or not. You know, sometimes they sort of deny this. Um, and sometimes they admit it, but uh, yeah, it's, I'm usually hesitant to say like smartphones are going to, to harm someone or not, but when someone's brain is developing for the first time, especially if the smartphone is what you always go to for, you know, I feel a bit sad or anxious or depressed. And so I'm gonna distract myself and just sort of shut my brain off and use my phone. Um, I think the, the, the bigger danger for kids is the opportunity cost. That anything that you're, and that's true for us as well, but any time that you're spending using your phone as your coping mechanism is time that you are not spending learning some other skill. Uh, and so I think it is important to, to try to avoid that. Um, parents that I've talked to over the years, uh, some good strategies are those things about the, the kids, the kids' friends comes over uh, as well phones sort of go in a, a basket at the front hall, you know, and, and actually just being very firm about that is probably the way to go. I don't think uh, negotiating is um, probably something you want to do too often because uh, kids certainly have more energy to, to kind of pester and, and continue to ask uh, questions about things like that. So um, yeah, <laughs> I think that's usually a good policy is just trying to put them off somewhere else. And actually modeling it is really important too. 
Um, it's the classic sort of thing of, of people and especially your kids are going to do what you do and not what you say. Um, and so in fact, setting aside some phone free time for everybody is a good thing to do. You know, that I'm not going to use my phone right now and neither are you, they're off over there. Um, so that's, that's another uh, possible strategy that people can use. Um, there's one question in the chat um, that asks, do you think that absent, uh, absent-minded smartphone use and its negative effects have impacted students' ability to learn in post, uh, post-secondary settings, for example, with problems focusing in class? Yeah, it's a great, uh, it's a great question. And so I'll start by saying, as a strategy, if you're trying to learn something uh, or you're trying to pay attention to something, having your smartphone right there with you and in front of you is a poor strategy because there's very good reason to believe that it's going to hurt your performance. So if you have, if you have only ever had the experience of trying to pay attention and trying to learn when your smartphone is right in front of you, you might not realize that it is actually hurting your performance, right? And actually there is evidence in some cases that people get so attached to their smartphones that uh, then you can get separation anxiety that hurts your performance as well. So you're, you're, you're in trouble in either case uh, if, it, if it gets to be that important to you. If you have had the experience of um, learning or paying attention without having your smartphone right in front of you and you, can, you, you have that kind of comparison that you can do, then you're better at sort of modulating and saying that sort of thing. It's hard to say, and it's hard to prove that using your phone in one situation and then going to another situation without it, uh, that it, that it has the carryover or lag that continues to hurt your performance. Some people have sort of suggested that kind of things. Others, others have sort of suggested that's not the case. Media multitasking, which is related. So just sort of like dual screening or using two things at once. That is another bad strategy. If you are using those two screens at once, that hurts your performance. If you go away from that, your performance isn't hurt. So it doesn't seem like it's, you know, really permanently affecting your brain and making that change. But the thing is, is with smartphones, it's with you all the time. So it doesn't actually really matter whether it's having a long-term physical impact on your brain or not, because you essentially are always choosing to use that bad strategy. Um, So I don't know if it impacts ability per se, um, but having it there and using it will definitely have that kind of a, a negative impact. And actually, there's another question for you. Um, do you know the proportion of people um, who are absent-minded users versus um, maybe more mindful users of their smartphones? Yeah, we, we've actually just recently started to try to look um, at the other side of that and looking at uh, purposeful smartphone use. Um, so we haven't uh, published that yet, but that's something that, that uh, I'm working on. Um, I wouldn't say that, that, that individuals are like either uh, sort of a purposeful user or an absent-minded user. Uh, I think everybody can use it for sort of multiple different reasons. Um, and, you know, so I would say I'm probably somebody who would be susceptible to that kind of absent-minded use if I let myself engage with it. If, if I sort of leave it far away, then um, I don't fall into the trap too much. But yeah, I would, I would hesitate to say, yeah, there's, there's people that we can sort of divide into these categories. It's more of this is something that everybody engages in to varying degrees. And there are certainly circumstances where smartphone use, even if it is purposeful, uh, is going to be harmful. Like if you are very intentionally texting and driving, uh, that's just as bad as absentmindedly testing, texting and driving. Um, it's, it's got very bad consequences for your attention performance. Um, so uh, it, it, it's more important in some situation than others. You know, there's, if it's purposeful or absentminded, um, if you're looking at it too often, there is, I know some evidence that uh, essentially because of screens always being at sort of one distance and always a flat surface that actually kids uh, whose eyesight and visual systems are developing 
there's actually an epidemic of nearsightedness um, because they're not viewing enough things in uh, three-dimensional space. Um, so there are cases where even purposeful use could have uh, negative consequences as well, less so for uh, psychological ones, attentional and emotional ones, often more, um, you know, musoskeletal uh, or uh, traffic accidents. Great. Thank you so much, Jeremy.